Right, thanks, Johnny. Let's get going. All right then. So let's take you back in time to a time when dragons ruled the land. And we've got a bit of a problem here. The Iron Bank is going bust. Uh, someone's been conning them out of loads of cash. They've been putting through fraudulent transactions, and now the bank is looking empty. Um, so what they've done is they've asked us to come in and help figure out who the bad guys are. So what we're going to try and do is use some modern techniques to solve an old problem, you know, the problem of fraud. I think it's pretty much existed for as long as we basically had money. Um, so we're going to use our modern techniques to see if we can help figure out what's going on here. And we've got the SQL machine learning. So I'm Chris Axon. I'm part of Stephen Feuerstein's Oracle Developer Advocate team, the answer team on Aston. I'll be covering the SQL stuff. And to help with data science, I've got Abby. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Uh, Abby Giles Haig. I'm the Chief Data Science Officer at Vertice. And I bring all the machine learning side to this presentation uh, and help Chris out with his SQL every now and again. Yeah. OK. So. Um, and hopefully we'll come together and figure out what's going on here. We'll, we'll see, right? We'll see, hopefully. <laughs> yeah. So, um, as I said, the the Iron Bank has got all these uh, transactions which they've lost money on. Um, so what they've done is they've gone through and they've produced a big tome, you know, back in the days when they actually write things down on, on paper, physical paper, and given this all to the hand of the king. And they said, there you go, here's our transactions figure out what, you know, why things are fraudulent, or see if you can find some common underlying causes so that when new transactions come in, we can go, aha, we think that's fraudulent. So the hand sits down and pours over these uh, books for hours and hours, and eventually finds a couple of common themes for the fraudulent transactions. So the first one, nice and straightforward. There's a lot of transactions with a value of exactly 10 million. And it turns out a lot of these were, in fact, dodgy transactions. So, you know, it, it's quite unusual to have lots of transactions for an exact round number. Usually they're like, you know, 99 cents or something like that or some other value of um, fractional pence. But there's a lot of these 10 million transactions. So we want to pull those out. Nice and simple to start with. But the second one is a little bit more complicated and a bit more interesting. The hand has identified that there's been a problem where people have been transferring money around their house in an effort to clean this. So it takes a bit more explanation. I'll go into the detail of what that means in a minute. Um, but for now, we'll just kind of look at the data we've got. We've basically got a standard transactional table. And you've got your regular transactional type information, when it was made, the um, amount, the transaction ID, and so on. Um, we've also got the sender and receiver accounts, and usually that's all you'd have to help us um, apply the machine learning algorithms and also potentially help with our rules. We've augmented that with extra metadata about the sender and receiver. So not just their account ID, but the name of the person, which house they're in, their gender and so forth, because maybe, you know, it turns out some, some particular house is um, carrying out more types of fraudulent transactions, for example. So we've got that information for the sender. We've also added in that information for the receiver. So we can cross it all up. Um, and then we end up with a big load of transactions. So we've got a table with all these various values in, just a small, small sample of data to give you some idea of what's going on. Um, and we've got about 100,000, a little over 100,000 of these transactions. So now we need to write some SQL, which is going to implement those rules. First rule, rule one, very simple, nice and straightforward. Just write a where clause. This is SQL 101, isn't it, Abby? Uh, I've got that one covered, Chris. 100%. Exactly. I've got that one. I, I think it, if, you, if you can't write this, then you, you probably shouldn't even be watching this. You know, go back to like beginner's SQL. Um, take so, one of those courses. Yeah, even <laughs> as a data scientist, got the where clause. That's fine. It, exactly. Um, the second thing, as I said, is a bit more interesting. Um, and the problem itself probably requires a bit of explaining before we jump into how we're going to try and find it with the SQL. So we've got a situation a bit like this. Imagine I've got some ill-gotten gains from somewhere, some dirty money, and in, in an effort to clean it, what I'm going to do is pay it into my account, and I'll transfer it over to Abby, and she will transfer that money out. And then hopefully we've got some clean money, and we can get away with whatever whatever it is we've been up to. Um, so 
we're going to keep it just this nice and simple me to Abby for this example. But you know, back in the um, age of dragons, they probably weren't sophisticated. You know, even this would, would have been tough for them to spot. Um, but also just to keep the examples a bit more manageable for this. Um, these days, people trying to carry out these kind of fraudulent attacks or I'm, so I'm led to believe when it comes to this, you know, I'm not an expert in this. <laughs> I'm led to believe that they would do something a bit more like this, you know, get, I'd get the money and instead of passing it directly to Abby, I'd first hand it over to Gianni and then he'd transfer the money over to Christian and so on and so forth around the 50 or so of us that are watching till eventually that money makes it over, way, over to Abby and, and she'll cash it out. The theory here being, if we can just make this chain long enough, eventually the bank won't be able to follow it and won't spot that something dodgy is going on. Probably a little a tenuous idea. Ultimately, you know, if you've got a large sum of money making its way through the banking system, someone's probably going to spot that. Um, but also there's the risk that someone at some point might kind of go, well, we're going to bail out. Maybe Christian's going to go, I, I'm gonna, I want to keep this money from them myself, not transferring it to anyone else. And so um, we all lose out. So we could identify something like this using SQL as well. Um, not exactly, but we can do something like this. But criminals are becoming increasingly more sophisticated and trying to do something like this. So if I've got 1,000 euros that I want to clean, instead of passing that all 1,000 around everyone and just hoping it eventually gets to Abby, I'll split it up between the 50 of odd of us on this call. So each person get 20 euros. I'll give all of you watching 20 euros in the hope that you will then also transfer that 20 euros onto Abby and then she'll cash the money in. Yeah. Oh, yes. <laughs> and you know, we'll run off with cash. It's like, okay. Um, not only is this significantly harder to spot um, from, you know, a bank's perspective because lots of small value trans <laughs> transactions um, are just fairly normal. It also makes the problem that if someone decides that they, want to bail out or gonna you know um, take the money themselves they've only got 20 euros so our maximum loss per person is 20 euros um, so as you see we've got people like Wayne saying he wants his 10 percent I mean I oh, come on there's always nah. some people <laughs> come on no, no. these are our we, games Chris we, we've come up with a scheme right Abby we want <laughs> yeah we want the money <laughs> exactly so um, we'll see you know these People do these more sophisticated things nowadays. For now, we'll keep it just nice and simple. I've got the money, transfer it to Abby, and hopefully we can get away with that. So how can we spot that? Well, the first thing that we want to do is limit the types of transactions we're looking at to just transfers and paying in, paying out, cash in, cash out. Then what we want to do is find if there has been a recent transaction of the same value in the same house. So we can do this with this max here. So what I'm saying, if this max analytic function finds a transaction, then we, we tag it and say, is something suspicious going on here? So how do we do that? Well, what I'll do is partition it up by sender, receiver, and transaction amount. So if we imagine, let's say we're all in-house Oracle, and we've been transferring money between each other, they will be considered as kind of one pot, but also we split it up by transaction value as well. So we only compare, you know, one euro transactions against each other, 10 euro transactions, uh, you know, 100 euro, 1,000 euro, and so on. So we can see if there's been transactions of the same value with the house oracle. And of course, there is a time component to this. I get the money, transfer it on. So we need to sort it by date, um, find when it starts, and go through. Now, by default, if we do this and just say order by date, um, then the windowing clause is range between unbounded proceeding and current row. What does that mean? It means consider every single previous transaction we've ever received and the current transaction. Doesn't sound right, does it, Abby? <laughs> no, that's still going to flag everything, isn't it, Chris? Well, that's right, because of course we're finding, saying if that max is not null, but we're including ourselves in that max. So even if we've only got one transaction for a given value, well, we're still always going to get something. So a couple of things. We need to make sure we exclude 
the current transaction from there. So we need to strip that out. The other thing is, of course, we don't want to compare back of all time for all history um, because, you know, if you've got 10, 20, 30, whatever years worth of transactions, the probability of just by chance having two transactions of the same value gets very, very high. It's, it's not quite certain, but it gets very, very close to that um, for pretty much any value, really. Um, so we want to limit this and say, rather than has been over all of history, in the past 90 days, has someone made a transaction of the same value in the same house? So we can change this to 90 preceding and one preceding. So what that does is 90 is the value we subtract off the transaction date for the current row. So we look back 90 days and also one preceding. So subtract off to yesterday. Of course, that creates a bit more of a problem. If, if we're quick, me and Abby, I get the money this morning, pay it in, transfer it to her. She cash it, cashes it out this afternoon. We got away with it, right, Abby? Or at least we've got away with it today because um, we've excluded, you know, we're not being granular enough if we're fast. Um, so we want to check not as far back as yesterday. We want to include maybe up to a minute ago or the past minute. So we can divide that through by fractional values. So we can use that to see if there's been transactions of the same value and we can try and flag these and say something suspicious going on here. Um, I said if we'd been a bit more sophisticated and tried created the chain a bit longer, so we're passing this money around everyone here who's watching, um, we could do we could kind of infer that just by counting the number of transactions. Now this obviously doesn't necessarily say and say the we've all passed it between each other strictly in order, but if you've got a large number of transactions of exactly the same value around the house in a short period of time it's probably worth looking into at very least, right? Something a bit suspicious is going on. Probably, right, Abby? Yeah, definitely, 100%. Exactly. So we've got these um, and let's let's put them in. So we'll put the rules into production. Okay. Okay, so Chris, I've got to say, I'm quite impressed. The SQL rules seem pretty powerful and can do quite a lot. Massive question though, how well did you do? Well, that's the all important question, isn't it? Right, so let's look at this and um, let's figure out how we got on. Um, so we've looked back over our historical transactions and what we've previously identified as fraud and found out that our error rate is about 1%. So we have correctly tagged 90%, no, 99%, I should say, 99% 90, of transactions. We've got um, the correct fraud assessment for it. Um, and the fraud rate within those transactions was, again, about 1%. So these numbers look pretty good, right? We must have done it. Yeah. Sounds uh, good, Abby? Yeah, it sounds pretty good, actually. So um, come on then, Chris. If we've done all this work, who's doing all the well, okay, let's, stuff? Okay, so let's see the transactions we pulled out. So we'll, we'll just look at the sender and receiver house, because that's what we care about. Um, pull them out. Uh, top there, we've got nobody. Maybe let's say wildlings. And oh, who's that? The Night's Watch. Uh, sat up on that wall. Who exactly. knows what they're up to? They must be probably trading, doing something with the wildlings and who knows, but you know, it's, um, yeah, uh, okay. We need to get them in. Let's get them in for questioning. Right, right? get Let's... them in for questioning. Come on. Uh, okay. Yep. Yeah, good work. Good work, okay. Chris. So we've locked him up. We've locked Snow up. Job done, right? Yeah. Tiny, tiny, insignificant, kind of still losing money. What? Kind of losing money. And you've managed to really annoy the Baratheons by putting your rules in place because all their transactions have been blocked. What? So what? come on, Chris. You've lost us. We're still losing money and the Baratheons are upset. So what you, what's going on with your rules? That's a good question. Um, I think, I, all right then. So I think we'll have to come back to this in a minute, Abby. I'll, I'll just okay. dodge the question. <laughs> like, all right, you're dodging be, the question. Be a politician. <laughs> no, no. Um, before we look at that, let's take a, a bit of a bit more theoretical look into things. Um, and we're going to have a completely different example. Now, <laughs> before we show this, we must make clear that this is something we came up a very long time ago. Um, and current events just happen to be coincidentally related to this. So, um, and I hope you all are very, <laughs> feeling very um, happy and healthy at home. But let's imagine you do in fact feel sick. Not with um, the virus we're all hoping not to get, 
but with something else. Let's imagine it's, it's, I don't know, legs falling off itis, right? It's a very rare disease. You've gone to the doctor, you've been tested for it, and um, they said, yep, it's true, it's come back, you have got, or the test has come back, says you have got this rare disease. Now, like I say, it's uncommon. About one in 10,000 people have this or get this at some point, but the test is pretty accurate, like 99%-ish accurate. So pretty as close as you're going to get for most kind of medical tests. There's always errors, you know, mislabeled things, spillages, and so on. So we're doing really well here. So we've got this rare disease, but a highly accurate test has told us we've got it. How are people feeling at this point? Are people like feeling scared and like, ah, got legs falling off itis? It's like, uh, yeah, I'm <laughs> a little bit worried right now, Chris. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Exactly. My legs gonna fall off. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, it's, it's not something you want to, want to have happen, right? Um, so it's. Uh, well, let's look at the numbers and let's look and see how we are actually doing. Let's see whether or not we should be scared in this scenario. So let's imagine we've got 1 million people. Um, so if we look at our 1 million people, uh, 1 in 10,000 of those, so 100 of them are actually genuinely are, are going to be sick. Um, but the vast majority, 998, whatever thousand, are going to be perfectly healthy. Now. Of those 100 people who are sick, the test is 99% accurate. So the test will come back for 99 of them and say, you are sick. For one really, really unlucky person, they will ha have the disease, but the test will come back yeah. um, negative and told them they're fine. <laughs> That's not good, is it? I mean, bad day. No. That was a really bad day. <laughs> exactly. You don't want to be that person. But it's pretty unlikely you're going to be that person. But things are a bit more interesting when we look at the healthy group. As we say, most people are healthy and the test will accurately come back and tell them that, yes, indeed, they haven't got it. But of those 999, whatever it is, people who um, are healthy, 1% of them are going to be incorrectly told that they are sick. So nearly 10,000 people. So if we look at the, num the people who've been told they're sick. 99 of them are actually sick and have it, and 9,999 of them have been told they're sick when actually they're perfectly healthy. You're about 100 times more likely to be in the healthy group than the sick group. Hmm. Suddenly it's not so clear that you should be worried here, right? Any more is it, Abby? Not, not so much, but this is starting to explain to me what's going on with your numbers because the 9999 in the top right hand corner explains why the Baratheon's transactions are all getting stopped. They're right. not actually committing fraud, but you tag them as committing fraud. Mm -hmm. And the number one at the bottom says that the fraud's still going to get through. So we're still going to lose some money. Just some. Yep. Not maybe as bad as uh, it was in the past. Yeah. Okay. So. So in my world, we call this a confusion matrix, and we have specialist names for those boxes. So we have a true positive, a true negative, I'm waiting for Chris to move, there we go, yeah, yeah, true yeah, positive, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> true negative, false positive, and false negative. And depending where you are in the business and what your business problem is, depends on what you're going to read in the confusion matrix. So in our bank scenario, or in the in terms of the hand of the king, here, he wants to stop the fraud. So he's really going to be concentrating on the false negatives, i.e. where we miss the fraud. But if you're the hand of the king's marketing guru, who's trying to get more customers to come and use the bank, then I might be looking at the false positive and looking at the Baratheon situation where they're getting all their transactions stopped, and actually, they're not doing anything wrong but we're stopping all their transactions. Mm. So it really does depend which side of the coin you sat on. Yeah, exactly. So it's important. All right, so um, I think we need to look at how we're actually doing. Yeah. And Come on then, Chris, <laughs> tell me really how well did you get on? All right, okay. So, um, well, bef before we do that, actually, let's think. So we said our error rate was 1% and our fraud rate was 1%. There is a trivially easy way to get these the error rate to exactly match your fraud rate. Let's see if anyone's quick on the chat. Let's see if they can figure out what it is while we, while we uh, 
think about it. I noticed uh, William Hutchinson was way ahead of us with the original problem, and it's like, is this a false positive or false negative, right? So <laughs> you, yeah. you, you're quick there, William. <laughs> um, see if anyone can oh, give him another few seconds to kind of think about why they might have... Uh, <laughs> I think Chris has put disclaimer as well. Just because we're in Switzerland, we're not doing money laundering. Promise. Mm. Yes. Mm. <laughs> I'll, I'll pro I promise. I'm sure that's true, Christian. I'm. I'm. They say we're not here to accuse anyone of anything. We're just explaining how things. <laughs> you know how you might detect these things. Oh, okay, they're, they're a bit quiet on the chat. Let's let's go for it. So, um, there's a, the trivial easy way is just to say, well, make everything not fraud. Just put everything through and in that case the figures exactly match each other we've all the perfectly normal transactions which is most of them um will go through and all the fraudulent transactions will also go through we haven't done anything <laughs> so there we go yeah um, so even if we didn't have your sql rules and we just put everything is not fraud we'd still get your same results so exactly so it's, I it's think time we need to you know, yeah dig a bit deeper we need to dig a bit deeper so, as I said, there was a little over 100,000 transactions, um, and we pulled out just 80 of those as fraudulent when, it turned, when in fact they actually were. Um, the vast majority of perfectly innocent transactions were, again, correctly classified as fine. As Avi says, the things we want to look at as those true and false, uh, false positives, false negatives. So let's first look, let's bring these out here, and first look at the false negatives. People uh, who were carrying out fraud, but our rules just let them through. Well, there's about 1,200 of those. So if you were committing fraud under these rules, you were about 15 times more likely to get away with it than actually be caught. Hmm. <laughs> okay. Where, not brilliant. <laughs> not brilliant. Um, and looking at the Baratheon side of the thing, they're going, we've done nothing. What the heck? What's going on? Well, you're about 10 times more likely to be in that group than be someone who, again, is actually doing something they shouldn't be doing. So we've done really, actually quite badly, haven't <laughs> we? I mean, I mean, yeah, a little bit, yeah. Okay, You're gonna so annoy on. the Baratheons, yep. yep. So how can we get on? Yep. Let's move over to my world, which is machine learning. All right, okay, let's go to machine learning then. <laughs> okay, yes. So in machine learning, we have two types of machine learning. We have supervised and unsupervised. So supervised is where the data has been augmented or labeled. So in our case, the, the hand of the king went through and he labeled ones and zeros for fraud, not fraud, which is great. We can use those labels to train a model. If you don't have those labels, and sometimes in fraud, you really don't have those labels, you can use unsupervised learning models. For today's demo, we're going to stick with the supervised and we're going to show you how we can not use rules, but use machine learning to kind of generate the same things Chris did. So, in Chris's world, he looked at the data on the left-hand side. So he was really interested in someone either telling him rules or find, figuring out rules himself to kind of input into the SQL. I'm not that interested on the stuff on the left. I'm interested in the column fraud, the augmented one. And I'm going to ask the machine to essentially find the patterns for me. I don't actually have to tell it what the patterns are. So to do that, we have some great um, ways of doing it, but the first thing we have to do in machine learning is split the data and we're going to split it 80 20 and the database actually has our back on this. So to help us, the, we can use the function sample and 80 and create a trained data set. And if we use the seed function, it enables us to repeat this later on. To get the test data, we can then use the minus function to create the test table. So really simple, really easy SQL to get our train and test. So cool. nice all and right. easy. Look, even I'm doing SQL today, Chris. <laughs> well, there we go. We're all, we're all learning something. <laughs> so if we move on, we're going to yeah. essentially set up what we're going to train, what kind of model we're going to use for our machine learning. So to do that, we create a table called model settings. And we're going to insert two rows into that table. The first one is the algorithm name that we're going to use. So in this example, we're going to use the naive Bayes algorithm. And the database has an amazing feature called prep auto. So this is a way of handling nulls or mismatching data types, etc. It'll average things um, and it'll prepare it for you. So you don't have to worry about that. So nice and simple, really easy to do. So once we've got the model settings, we essentially need to create the machine learning model. Now, 
most people on this webinar will know that it's a, you know, machine learning has been in the database for a very long time. And if you have ever heard Charlie Berger talk about this, he says, don't move the data, move the models. So get the machine learning down to the database. And therefore we have a database function, dbms data mining dot create model. So to create a model, we have um, a few feet things to add in there. So we're going to tell it what name we want to call the model. So in this came, it, case, it's GOT for model. We're going to use the database mining function classification, so it's one or zero. And we're going to give it the table name train. The unique column in there is transaction ID. We want it to use the augmented column fraud, and we want it to use the settings table we just created, which is the um, naive Bayes algorithm. Simple, right? Yeah, sounds pretty straightforward. Even I can do this, right? <laughs> yeah, so press go and it's off. Hey, okay. So now, I guess we need to... Yeah, so we created a test table, so we need to apply those results to the test table. Don't worry, Chris, database has got you back again. <laughs> so we can use another function, dot apply, to apply the model to a test data set. So in this case, our test data table. So to do that, we tell it the name of the model, we tell it the table we want to apply it to, which column is unique, and then ask it to put the results into four results. Dead okay. easy. Dead easy, all right. I think it's, it's time to figure out uh, how much better you've done here, right, right Abby? Okay. I'm, okay. Uh, I, I, are, you, are you feeling good about this? Uh, I'm, I'm super confident. Come on, Chris, this is dead easy. Uh, Hang on, let, let me just look at this slide a little bit closer. Hang on. <laughs> what does that say? <laughs> yeah, uh, okay. So my error rate's 3%. You know, 3%, that's okay. It's fine. Yeah, but I'm only 1%. 1%. Come on. <laughs> you're, you're doing worse than me here, right? <laughs> uh, it's 3%, Chris. It's fine. It's fine. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, okay. So we probably need to break this down into our confusion matrix so that we can really compare your results to my results. Okay. Uh, yeah, fair. That sounds fair. All right. We okay. should do that. Right. Okay. So, because, you know, it, the database has got my back again, I've got a compute confusion matrix. Mm, nice and yeah, easy. Clever, mm, very clever. Very clever. All clever. All right. So, I can send into it that the results table that I've got against the test table that I asked it to apply against, um, that the target column is fraud, and ask it to generate a confusion matrix. From right. that, we can then fill in our answers. Okay, should we do it then? Come on then, let's see how oh. well I did. Okay, wow. Well, um, mm. Okay, come on, that top number's not too bad. 832, I managed to find 832 of the transactions that are actually fraud. Okay, That's not about, bad. About, about 10 times more than me, right? Yeah. 10 times more than you. So, <laughs> yeah. yeah, but to be fair, you're still twice as likely to get away with it. Yeah, yeah, okay, so. Yeah, but you, I, yeah, all right, you're doing better there, but I think we need to look at that ne that negative oh, uh, number, or false positive number. That's pretty high, right? Yeah, the Baratheons are going to be really annoyed. Mm, yeah, okay. So we're catching more people, but we're also annoying more people. Yes, pretty mm. much. Okay, all right, okay. Well, I think actually, because we, we really want to catch people, we want to, or at least start tagging our transactions, for who looks like, uh, needs to be brought in for questioning. Right? Yeah, to be fair, that's what they asked us to do, was find the fraud. So, I guess I win on that sense. Yeah, all right. Okay, then. Okay, so after we've built this confusion matrix and oh, we run your models and things, we've got a lovely little table like this, haven't we, where we've got the transaction IDs and ones or zeros. Um, so, to find the transactions that are actually fraudulent, we need to then pick whichever of these rows has the highest probability. So we've got top transaction, probability of zero, prediction zero, so not fraud is probability, no, 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 no. We're pretty sure that's not fraud. So we need to pull them out. Um, so there's lots of tricks we could use to do this with SQL. Um, I'm excited, rub my hands, time to write a bit more SQL again. Um, what I'm gonna do is sort the rows according to the probability for each transaction ID, and do that with the row number function. So they'll be numbered one or two. So if that top one, highest probability was zero, so that would be one, and the other one will be two. So we'll give ones or twos, pull out the one with the highest prob 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 probability, um, just by querying it like that. 
we can join that to our original transactions table and let's let's find out shall we see who it is who was yep who, who was who running is? who was running jail or at least questioning over zoom <sighs> there we go had to be had to be the lannisters didn't it they've about That's 10 it. times <laughs> 10 times as many dodgy transactions as any get them in else. chris get yeah. them in yeah, well, I'm not sure we can actually get, you know, round anyone up for questioning at the moment, but maybe we just freeze their accounts or something, right? Okay, fair enough. We'll freeze their accounts for now. Yeah, okay. Okay, so, well. So, I, I think we've done all right, Chris, but mm. I have a feeling that if we combine our two superpowers of SQL and machine learning together, we could do even better. Okay, so we'll we'll build them, combine, do both at the same time, essentially. Yeah, everything. pretty much. That's what what I'm suggesting. So in the world of machine learning, um, a lot of iterative approach and try something, fail fast, and move on. So we're going to combine your SQL rules with my machine learning, and we're hopefully going to save the Seven Kingdoms. Sound like a plan? It sounds like a plan. Okay. Let's go for it. All right then. So, um, so we're really interested in in finding who's been committing fraud. So we are going to, if either the rules or or the machine learning tag something as fraudulent, we will say, well, we'll flag it and say we need to pull this out and investigate it. Right. Yep. Uh, so we can join the table, the rule query from my rules, your output of your applying your model, and just take all the rows where there's a one in either of them. Um, and they will say that's fraud and figure it out. So mapping that onto our confusion matrix, we get some figures like this. So it doesn't look, at first glance, it doesn't look too different to your machine learning. Um, but we do see our true positives is now higher than ever. We caught nearly 900 people. Um, so you are even less likely than ever to get away with it. So that, that's good in terms of catching things, right? But Yeah, not bad. It's, we've got a, cost, a covered a cost here, right? Though, hasn't it? Yeah, we're not just going to annoy the Baratheons anymore. I think we're going to add a few more of the houses to that one. Yeah, exactly. So we are flagging a lot of things. So it's that balancing act, isn't it, of where you want to be? In, yeah, right? it, it is. It it's it really is down to the business question. And in this case, the hand of the king asks us to stop fraud. So combining our skills, we've managed to do that. But if you're the marketing expert sat next to the hand of the king, you're probably not that happy right now. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, if we, if, if we just went with SQL, the, the marketeers would be happy. We're, we're not oh, annoying yeah. any, anyone with any of these calls saying, you know, have you been, is this really you that carried out this transaction, right? So Yeah. But if I'm the hand of the king trying to stop fraud, then actually the SQL and the machine learning is the one I want. Exactly. So, yeah. It, I think, this, as you say, this confusion matrix is really useful to help think more about the problem rather than just what's our overall error rate. It gives a clear, clearer picture of what's really going on, doesn't it? Yeah, if you just have a simple accuracy score, which is what we started off with, it doesn't really drill into the numbers enough to tell the whole story of what's going on under the hood. Exactly. Okay, so let's, let's recap on this a bit. So we talked about it being SQL versus machine learning or SQL with machine learning or one or the other, there's perhaps another way we could think about this. And that is writing code that is deterministic versus code that is probabilistic. So on the SQL, on the rule side, we are writing deterministic rules. So someone in the business has come up with a big long list of rules and said, if these criteria, any of these criteria are hit, then we will tag it as fraud. You know, maybe there's a whole bunch of other exceptions there. Um, now, these rules can get exceptionally complicated, but you know, I'm sure if I gave any of you watching this a big list of rules that you needed to apply um, to transactions or whatever and said, if these things happen, do this, you would be able to do it. Um, it might take you a while. It might be horrible, messy, really gnarly code. Um, you may or may not use SQL, but eventually you'll, you, know, you can do it and you can check, okay, have a bunch of tests. Rule one. Criteria met, yes, we tagged it as fraud, so on and so forth. Um, so you know, based on what you've input, exactly what the output's going to be. But it's not quite the same with machine learning, is it, Abby? Yeah, no, my world's more kind of sliding scale, zero to 100. So I don't have a, it definitely is, and you follow that rule. It's somewhere. But then the question pops up of how close to 100 is 
certain and how close to zero are we absolutely certain it never actually is going to happen and then it gets even more gray because then i'm almost certain and i'm nearly impossible going to happen so where the business draws its line and says it's got to be over that percentage for me to feel very confident that it's definitely happening that's a bit of an education and therefore it's more probabilistic than it is deterministic mm. Yeah. Okay. So it's different. It's a bit of a mindset shift, really, isn't it? It is. And it is very possible to do, but you need to switch your mind from the simple rules and following them through to where in the scale are you ready to accept? Exactly. All right. So let, let's, let's recap and just go re compare these again. So start off with, we said SQL rules were deterministic and that, you know, you pass in a particular transaction and you can know exactly how you're going to classify it. Um, excuse me. I think it's worth kind of saying, although I've said it, it's deterministic and we know exactly what that means, we're probably actually fooling ourselves a bit, really. Just because a rule says it's probably fraud doesn't mean it is genuinely actually fraud, but, you know, so there's still some, we still actually all live in Abby's kind of gray sliding scale world. We just fool ourselves that we, we're not, right? Um, but the, the big advantage of this deterministic approach is it's, um, as I said, all competent programmers would be able to implement a big list of rules. You can test and verify exactly what's going to happen. And there are some things which are just very, very suspicious, and you always want to look into them um, regardless of whether or not they're actually fraudulent. So personal example, um, sometime last year, I bought a new laptop. Shortly after buying that laptop, I um, logged into my bank and made a large transfer to a new account. Um, some alarm must have gone on off in the bank. So it was late that day, maybe the next day, I got one of those phone calls and it was like, did you really make this transaction? Did it, was it actually you? You know, they, they spotted this um, and they've gone, ah, new, you know, new device, large transact, new large transaction. Maybe somebody's stolen my credentials and is trying to just clean me out, clean out my account. Um, and this is quite a, well, first up, it's a fairly unusual combination of things. Most of us get a new device maybe once a year at most, possibly probably less than that for a lot of us. Plus, how often do you make a new large transaction? You know, something that isn't your mortgage or rent payment, for example. Um, again, you might do those things once or twice a year. How often do you both do both of those things at the same time? For, uh, almost never. So it's very unusual that this will happen. So even if we tag them all, we're not actually going to be upsetting that many. Plus, I don't know exactly, but I imagine this is, that's a scenario which is also quite high risk. It has a very much higher probability than average of someone doing something you shouldn't do, like, you know, stealing my password and trying to clean my account out. So um, the thing with deterministic rules, we know we are definitely going to flag that, right? Can you say that, Abby? Yeah, not so much. Because it's probabilistic, um, it really depends where your threshold is. So you're going to have to sit with the business and work through some scenarios. So take yours, because the data's never seen it before and potentially doesn't know that that is extremely unusual. It might or it might not. It depends what the data looks like and whether that pattern appears in the data if it doesn't, then probably actually going to flag it quite high probability that it's unusual and fraud. But if it happens quite frequently, then actually it's going to say it's not. It's just the norm. It just happens. But I couldn't, couldn't tell you what the outcome was going to be every single time until I know what that model looks like and the results out of the model. Mm, yeah. Yeah. But uh, yeah, so you can't be sure, but you, you, know, you do have the advantage that at least the machine learning algorithm can infer these rules or dig it out, right? You yeah, know? you've got to be told do X, do Y, do Z, and you've got to program it in and test it and make sure it does X, Y, and Z. Exactly. And I think this is one of those things where you need people who've got real domain business knowledge experience and like years and years of it. You know, if you sit there and try and guess, um, well, we think this scenario sounds dodgy, so we will flag it. You'll probably get it wrong. You know, another personal example. So it must be about 15 years ago now, um, in the relatively early days of online, buying stuff online, um, I had a credit card 
and they had some kind of simple system which said if I spent something like more than 50 pounds online investigate it so I know I get a phone call did you really make this transaction sounds like a sensible precaution except I did this not probably not every month but certainly several times a year um, and I got so many of these calls I just stopped paying attention you know I was just like yeah did I buy something recently probably yeah I'll just like wave it through you know if you are constantly alerting people about something all the time then they, they switch off uh, it only helps if it's a very high chance or significantly high risk of actually being dodgy or it's very rare so it doesn't really matter you know you're not annoying people that very often so we need that domain knowledge whereas you don't do you i think no because as we explained you were looking at the left hand side of the data and then like you say being told what rules to apply in my world because i'm asking the machine to explore the data and explore the patterns it's going to identify things that maybe we didn't know maybe we hadn't seen maybe that we just weren't aware of and that's really good especially for things if you think of things like new cryptocurrency when that came on there wasn't a rule book that we could implement in the in the system to say this is what fraud looks like in cryptocurrency we had to essentially look for patterns look for new things to alert us that fraud was occurring so if we haven't got those rules or we don't have the what we call intelligence led approach where we can um, essentially tell them that these are the rules to follow or rule based then we can use intelligent led so we can let the machine find new intelligence for us to implement so rules are sometimes good but also you might not know everything chris <laughs> what <laughs> No. Well, not you okay. personally. <laughs> yeah, I don't know everything. I don't know everything. <laughs> um, but on the like rules approach generally, um, it's reusing for a lot of people, for most businesses, most IT departments, this is reusing existing skills. Most people are developers. They know how to code these rules. And of course, I'm not just talking about the IT team here either. As I, Abby was saying about the sliding scale of probabilities, it's also the wider business of them going, well, is something, is 80% chance high enough for us to, you know, look into this? What about 70%, 60%, you know? Um, so it's the business needs to understand how all this works as well. Whereas it's a bit more of a journey, as you said, with machine learning. It is, hopefully through this, we have shown people that these functions are inside the database. So we can still stay in your SQL world and inside the database, just using some new skills and approaches to look at data. So the data stays there, we can still use the SQL, we can still have all the good security, et cetera, but use the, new, the functions in the database to do machine learning, and then it's more actually presenting it to the business and taking them on that journey to understand the slight nuances and differences that you have between kind of deterministic and probabilistic. That's cool. So um, but I've got I've got one final thing I want to say to you, but oh, before we do that, okay. we, we, had a, we had a question from Yasin who said, why do I need to use SQL rather than change models hypothesis, F-score, or even ML algorithm when another one like anomaly detection? So do, do you want to say something there <laughs> I before say, I... Chris, do, you, do you want to answer that one? <laughs> <laughs> um, so you can um, change the models hypothesis. In this case, um, it's it's, a, it, it, it's more about what is the business's problem. So to really do um, production level machine learning and actually get return on investment on data science, and machine learning, all these amazing buzzwords we've heard in com conferences over the years, we have to have a business problem that is actually going to return investment to us. So they'll set out, in this case, the, the, the king's hand said, I want to stop fraud. So we had quite a clear business objective to achieve. And we didn't change the SQL to kind of match everybody's world, but actually presented to them what the world would look like and, and break down the kind of visualization of the data. Now the F score is another way that you can do that. So you've got accuracy, you've got confusion matrix, and ultimately you can also have F scores. F scores are really good and really delve deep into the analysis of where your model might be going right or wrong. Um, but my problem with F scores is it can be really hard to display and explain to a customer 
or explain to your board why one approach is not as good as another approach or what kind of result this is going to have and the impact it's going to have on the business. The confusion matrix is a really nice, simple way of displaying that data and telling the data story back to the business so that they understand the pros and the cons of each approach. And it then allows it to be compared quite easily and take them on that journey. So the last one that he mentions there is anomaly detection. So we did say at the beginning, the supervised and unsupervised. So within the database, we do have unsupervised um, SBN models and they are an anomaly detection oracle style. Um, and essentially you can do that. You can apply unsupervised learning models to give you these patterns and new insight that you've never seen before without even having the labels. So there's just different ways and it all really depends on what is your business question. So, so like I say, you've got to look at that, but I think that there is an, another, another thing to be aware of and a reason why you may or may want to use rules at least in some scenarios um, and that is well if we've got a rule and the Brathians are complaining is why have you flagged us tr our transactions we go aha we know exactly what's going on here we just follow the code through oh you tripped that rule that is why we told you you know your transaction was dodgy you know exactly why that happened with um, any rule based system trace it through, figure out what happened, and then you can change them if it's a bug, you can explain it if you're some kind of audit and so on. Um, nice and simple, nice and easy, it's clear to everyone exactly why th one thing happened or not. Can you say that, Abby? Um, <laughs> <laughs> okay, so possibly not. Okay, so this is a whole new world of machine learning called explainable machine learning or explainable AI. The idea that we could fully explain any machine learning and how it achieved the answer it, it does. Um, and in some machine learning models, such as decision tree, that's relatively easy. But in other models, such as naive Bayes, not so easy. Now, there is another concept known as model behavior. So you can feed it different data types, uh, sorry, different data sets. So maybe it's fully fraud data or all males or all, fe all females and different scenarios where you can then see what the model would have given as an answer. And that gives you an idea of how the model's going to behave. But you're quite right. If the Baratheons came to me and said, right, you've stopped this transaction, explain to me exactly why it has. Yeah, <laughs> so easy. Um, so that is something you do need to be aware of, especially if you're working in the, the wonderful world of GDPR and you have to have that front and center of your data and how you're doing things. So it's just something to be aware of. It's not a, a massive negative to machine learning, but you just need to be aware of it. Yep, good point. All right. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. what we wanted to bring to you in this presentation was the pros and the cons of machine learning and SQL when you're looking at things like fraud analysis doesn't have to be fraud, it could be marketing, it could be anything where you're trying to do something to predict the future and apply it onto future transactions or future interactions um, and understand the pros and cons of what's gonna happen. So your false positives and your false negatives. You might need to explain to the business how that's gonna affect it. And that's going beyond just ones and zeros, but you know, in the case of the Baratheons, are we really gonna upset customers if we put those transaction blocks in place? And sometimes we're not ready to take that step into probabilistic and you need to stay in deterministic because of things like GDPR and being able to fully explain how you got to your decision, you might not be ready for probabilistic. So I guess our final word is, which one are you ready for? Which one is your business ready for? Great point. So there we go. <laughs> 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 Ten minutes to spare as well, so yeah, yeah. But I think it's fair, Chris. If anyone's got any questions, we're yeah, happy yeah, to take exactly. them. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, I can hang around for a bit if we've got some uh, any other questions that want to come up, um, and yeah, just hope you enjoy this and found it useful and and informative, <laughs> entertaining. So, oh, oh right. <laughs> So it's all gone quiet, so we've either done a really good job or everybody fell asleep. Uh, or they, they're just like, what, what did they just tell us? What did they just say? You know? We've <laughs> even lost Gianni in all this. We've gone quiet on us. Oh, 
he's, he's well, I away. think Johnny no. is just muted at the moment. No worries. We're here. Yeah. I'm, ju I'm just developing new strategies to keep cleaning things. <laughs> <laughs> I said, I thought we said we don't talk about this. <laughs> I um, said it's things. He didn't specify the amount of money that he's trying to transfer to you, Christian. <laughs> you were not supposed to deduce that. <laughs> he, meant socks. Yeah, he meant socks. You, you have a question waiting in the Q&A. Yes, okay. Oh, okay. So, the, so the, this is exactly the problem RTD was designed to solve. Is that supported still? So I have no idea what RTD means, so I'm hoping you've got some insight there, Abby. <laughs> Uh, RTD was designed to solve. Is it still supported? Wow, that uh, RT, RTD is is real time decisions. Uh, okay. Ah, okay, thank you. Um, so real time decisions. If you stop to think about um fraud analytics, there's actually two parts to it in a bank. Um, you have transaction monitoring, which is essentially where your real time decisions happen. Um, and again, transaction monitoring when you delve into it. Um, depending which bank you're working in, um, can have rule-based or it can have a mixture of rule-based and ML in the background. Real-time decisions um, do get it wrong and people can have their transactions blocked. So if you take Chris's um, laptop and a new transaction, I'm pretty sure that tra transaction didn't actually go ahead right at that point in time. They probably delayed it in the system and gave him a call and said, do you really want that thousand pounds to go to Abby? Um, you know, it seems a bit dodgy, which is their way of doing re real-time decisions, but it's got a slight delay in it. The other part of it is anti-money laundering or fraud analytics, whereby you're looking at a larger da data set to look for new patterns, new insight, and new, if you like, new rules. Um, and that's then dealt with by a human person who augments that and looks at the um, kind of the holistic picture, puts context to it. So. Um, you know, 20 pounds to some people might not be anything, but to others, it might be a lot of money. So adding context to it and understanding the full story helps us to actually find new rules and new ways to improve our rules to help real-time decision. Okay, next oh, one. Here's, a, here's an interesting one. <laughs> Give examples of business pain solved with machine learning in context of GDPR. <laughs> <laughs> I actually do have one. Okay, go on. Okay, go on. <laughs> um, so an example of business pain solved with ML. So um, the example, I can't name the company for GDPR reasons, um, but essentially they needed to go through old staff records and identify the documents that were needed to remain on a record for a period of time and old records that needed to be deleted out. The downside of that was that these documents had been scanned in, so we didn't have any proper data to look at. So we used a machine learning algorithm to learn where the data was on the sheet, to then do character recognition, to then look at the dates um, that it was put on, that it did match the staff record and therefore it was valid to remain or flag it to be deleted. If it wasn't very confident that it needed to be deleted, it had to go to a human to be augmented or checked. So there is a real life example where we used ML to actually help solve a GDPR example. Now I know that we've got on the, the, the panel, at least in Christian and Gianni, they have a great spatial graph one whereby they're able to use it to help with who's looking at which dashboards, etc. Again, so are the right people looking at the right data and when you make changes in things like RPDs, you're not changing or breaking GDPR. So I'm sure those guys could also jump in with examples. Johnny, Christian, did you want to? No, they've gone quiet. Uh, well, I mean, she just mentioned it, so <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of done. <laughs> but I, I, I've got it. I think I've got that one right, haven't I, Christian? You, you were able to track who's, who's looking at what data and making sure it's appropriate. Uh, Johnny, uh, Johnny has the solution uh, probably lying around somewhere on his laptop right now. Johnny? It, it is. I mean, it's not really machine learning so far because the, the challenging point is what is the business meaning of something? 
I mean, we can get all the data lineage, we can get all the technical definition of things. We can know exactly where something is coming where something is coming from and what kind of transformation we did, but still giving a business meaning out on a column in a database, that's even for machine learning fairly challenging. So we can only do guesses, really high level guesses, like this table contains customer information based on column names. So we can guess that the other columns of the table are also customer information that are sensible. So it's not really full machine learning, it's more like everything common sense and uh, a lot of manual work to fix yes this is a sensible column no this is not and, and so on yeah so i think just to kind of finish off alex's question um there's loads of examples of where ml is used and in context of gdpr it's really to again it goes back to that question of can it be left fully to a machine's decision um or do you need to augment it with a human um cross-checking it or um, even subsetting the data so that then humans are, are involved. And that may well um, meet your GDPR um, requirements. It does depend on the data set you're working with and whether it's personally identifiable or not. So there's lots of little nuances in GDPR and machine learning where you just need to be aware. And it also steps into the world of ethics and machine learning. Um, and that's another kind of discussion as well. Yeah, I don't think we've got time for that today. No, we? that's a long discussion, that one. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Alrighty then. I think, I think uh, that's us done. I think I can see Mike's uh, just yeah, coming online Mike, as well. Mike's here, so I guess we should probably let him start getting, sharing the screen and take take things over. Right, so, thank you thank all. Thank you very much, Chris thank and you. Thank no you very much. Thanks, Abby. Thanks, Chris.